Hi, hello, I, I still haven't figured out an intro for these, but we'll get through it. You might be wondering why I've gathered you here today. Well, this week I'm finally dropping the long-awaited third installment of my Happy Science Roast series, but considering how long that's been awaited, like over a year at this point, I figure there's a good chance that many of you may not be familiar with the cult that makes anime, or you might just need a refresher that's not two hours long on all the kooky stuff they believe. So I made this video as a companion to that one, which should be premiering this Friday evening on the main channel, so make sure you got your popcorn ready for that. Anyway, let's just get into it. Happy Science was founded in 1986 by Ryuho Okawa, born Takashi Nakagawa, back then an employee of major Japanese trading firm Tomen Corporation. Though you could argue it really began the previous year when he started publishing books under a pseudonym about spiritual messages that he'd received from various historical and religious figures with help from his father and brother. At first, the organization took the form of a study group on human happiness, basically a book club for his kooky bullshit, which consisted of a few dozen members with Okawa positioning himself as their spiritual guru of sorts. By the next year, though, his audience had grown to nearly 400, and with it, his confidence had grown enough that he started sneaking in suggestions in his lectures that he might actually be some sort of holy prophet. That same year, he published the Trilogy of Salvation, The Laws of the Sun, The Laws of Eternity, and The Golden Laws, three books that together form what one might call the Happy Science Bible, outlining the religion's core doctrine, Okawa's beliefs about the nine-dimensional spirit world, and an account of Earth's real history, which is a lot longer and involves a lot more aliens than you might have initially thought. The books also contained an account of Okawa's early life, which it's worth noting would change substantially in later publications, along with some of the finer points of that doctrine and world history, so I'm not going to go into his early life because I think it's kind of murky and hard to track down facts. In 1989, Okawa published a fourth key book, The Rebirth of Buddha, in which he officially upgraded himself from holy prophet to full-blown messiah, declaring that he was the reincarnation of not just the OG Shakyamuni Buddha, but also six other gods and prophets who created and shaped the earth and human civilization over the last 330 million years. What's more, all of those gods were themselves merely aspects of an even greater super space Buddha named El Cantare, who created the entire universe. From there, Okawa's organization exploded in both revenue and membership, though its own reports of the latter appear to be greatly exaggerated and difficult to trust. The revenue is what really matters, though, because that year they were able to move into one of the most expensive office blocks in Tokyo with a reported rent of 25 million yen a month. And by 1991, Okawa had enough dough to fulfill his true destiny as a producer of anime. Happy Science's first original video animation, which was also coincidentally the first anime ever made by Kyoto Animation and legendary director Tatsuya Ishihara, came out in 1991, using its title to pose the question, Shiowasete Nani, or what is happiness? And the answer it arrives at after 15 minutes of its child protagonist just sort of puttering about and briefly dropping into his own personal hell for the crime of knocking an angel's hat off, is smiling more. For you see, when you smile, that makes your mom a little more okay with your dad neglecting the family for work, and that in turn means he can overwork even harder, and then his company will do better, and his boss will give him more money for that instead of pocketing all the profits for himself, and then your mom will be able to spend more on groceries, and the grocery lady will have more money to spend too, and so on and so forth until the whole economy is saved. Holy shit! Who knew it was so simple? Someone better send this OVA to the Federal Reserve, and they better do it fast, because the Japanese asset bubble popped like a month after this short came out, and it still hasn't recovered three decades later. Fucking frowny faces ruining everything. So that's how Okawa's anime career started. However, Happy Science wasn't the only cult getting into the anime business at the time. 
That same year, in an effort to indoctrinate more otaku and possibly children, the syncretic Buddhist sect Om Shinrikyo started a series of six-minute OVAs about their founder, Shoko Asahara, levitating all over the world to tell people that he was the second coming of Jesus and the Freemasons were coming to get them and cause the apocalypse. Thus began a vicious feud of tit-for-tat escalation between the two cults. Okawa said Asahara's anime was shit, so he retorted that Ryuho's waifus were trash. Okawa called Asahara a frog, so Anime Jesus wrote a whole book about how he was a hack fraud who barely knew anything about Buddhism or any other religion for that matter. Happy Science then ducked out of a televised debate between the two cults, so Shoko had Okawa's car rigged with deadly nerve gas. Then a month later, Am Shinrikyo did a wee bit of mostly unrelated terrorism, and with the Japanese cops taking care of them, Okawa was finally free to return to his true passion, anime. Two years later, in collaboration with Toei Animation, the group released their first feature film, Hermes Winds of Love, the epic tale of Okawa's seventh incarnation, King Hermes of Crete, who, guided by his sixth incarnation, Ophelus, the founding god of ancient Greece that Ryuho Okawa made up, united the people to overthrow the tyrannical King Minos and establish Greek civilization as history knows it today. Also, Hermes marries a lady named Aphrodite, who, according to scripture, would go on to reincarnate as Ryuho Okawa's wife, at the time, Kyoko Okawa. Then Hermes goes down to hell to beat King Minos up again to stop him from cursing his wife from beyond the grave, only this time Minos turned into a giant bull demon, not to be confused with the Minotaur, his son who got killed earlier in the movie. Also, he had an army of monkey demons with him, but by channeling the spirit of Ophelus, who was also himself, Hermes was able to summon his own army of angelic archers and yeet the beast from Crete once and for all. As movies go, Hermes Winds of Love was not great on many levels, with a nonsensical, meandering plot, a genuinely creepy, stalking-based romantic subplot, god-awful musical numbers, like five minutes of exposition to every one of plot or action, characters whose motivations barely track within individual scenes, let alone from scene to scene, the story is just an absolute mess. As, to be fair, you would expect from a guy who was pumping out like 30 books a year. However, the movie did have two saving graces. Firstly, it's hilariously campy over the top main villain. <sighs> you are such a bad loser, Hermes which would thankfully become something of a running theme in these films. It is, after all, a relatively high-budgeted feature film from the absolute peak of traditional cell animation in the late 90s and early 2000s, helmed by the veteran director of Kanikuman and Candy Candy. The background art's consistently gorgeous, it's got impressively fluid and detailed character animation, and the fight scenes have the intense, bloody charm of a schlocky 90s OVA, which the aforementioned director actually made a couple of, so that makes sense. Unfortunately, as we go on into the 20th century, future happy science films will not maintain that quality, but before we move into the DigiPaint era, they did release one more movie with that classic visual appeal. Well, 2000's Laws of the Sun isn't really a movie in the traditional structural sense. It's more like an animated documentary about the true history of Earth that Okawa revealed in his book of the same name. Although that history actually starts on Venus hundreds of millions of years ago, where El Cantare built a thriving, harmonious, spacefaring civilization and then blew the whole thing up with volcanoes because they weren't evolving good enough. 
Then, 330 million years ago, he made his second attempt here on Earth, reincarnating some of the Venusians as humans while inviting alien civilizations from across the cosmos to help us kill dinosaurs and, in return, through us, let their spirits evolve, which is something that can only happen on Earth, as this is the universe's designated spiritual training ground. Also, those various aliens brought with them eight great ninth dimensional spirits for El Cantare to hang out with, who would eventually incarnate as the earthly gods and prophets Jesus, Confucius, Moses, Manu, Maitreya, Zeus, Zoroaster, and Sir Isaac Newton. And together they formed a sort of spirit committee that told God he had to build a soul cloning device called a Pytron so more people and aliens could be reincarnated. Unfortunately, that backfired when some of those alien and human soul clones started being assholes and all their negativity pooled together to create hell, where eventually an alien cat boy named Satan would get sent for banging too many bitches, so he transformed into a demon and, and started ordering the other demons to make people be even bigger assholes, and once humanity reached a sort of critical mass of assholery, Earth's consciousness summoned a bunch of natural disasters to kill fucking everyone and reset civilization. Of course, mankind would eventually rebuild from that and started becoming assholes again, so 17,000 years ago, El Cantare incarnated once again on the lost continent of Mu as King Lamu to tell everyone to cut it out. Then human society was harmonious and prosperous again for a couple millennia until they forgot his teachings, started being assholes, and he had to sink their whole continent. So the diaspora of Mu went around Asia, creating various civilizations, including a very advanced one on Atlantis, where El Cantare incarnated once again as King Thoth to make sure no one would be assholes this time. And you can guess how that went. The descendants of Atlantis then went on to found several other, mostly Western civilizations of their own, but also the ancient Incan Empire, which then came under threat 7,000 years ago by a race of evil, shape-shifting aliens called the Reptalians, tricking them into sacrificing each other to provide the aliens with snackage, but also, more importantly, to exploit a legal loophole in the Galactic Treaty of Planetary non-interference. They then intended to have their compatriots immigrate to Earth so they could control the planet before the space police interfered. Lucky for our species, though, El Cantare saved the day by incarnating as the great king Rient Arl Crowd and teaching the Incan people how to drive away evil spaceships with the power of love. Like, literally the power of love. But watch out! because those wascally Waptalians are still around controlling the Chinese government and America in some of these movies. A few hundred years later, he reincarnated once more as Ophelus to make Greece happen, and then came back 2,000 years after that as Hermes to finish the job. Then, 2,600 years ago, he incarnated one last time as Siddhartha Gautama, the Shakyamuni Buddha to do all the Buddha stuff, but then also, at the very end, he gave a sermon to all of his followers where he told them that he was going up to space, but he'd be back one day as a Japanese businessman. And that brings us back up to now, or, you know, like, several years ago. Of course, they couldn't fit the whole history of Earth into one movie, so another three years later, Happy Science released a third, much uglier anime, this time adapting Okawa's other book about history, and also some predictions for the future, The Golden Laws. And, having learned from the response to the last one that history lectures on mescaline aren't exactly a narrative format that puts butts in seats, this time they chose to frame the lesson with a story about a kid from the far future and another kid from the even farther future fucking around in a time machine. A time machine that, I should note, was designed by Isamu Imakake, the artist behind all the sets and ship interiors in Cowboy Bebop, who was tragically indoctrinated into the cult a couple years before this, and would go on to direct the next six Happy Science anime. But I'm getting way ahead of myself now. 
It's kind of hard not to, though, because there just isn't that much to say about the Golden Laws. It doesn't really reveal anything new or interesting about happy science lore, besides the fact that time machines will apparently be outlawed shortly after they're invented due to a series of time travel accidents. Uh, take away the time travel gimmick, and it's just a series of vignettes that show in slightly more detail than the last movie how figures like Buddha and Jesus fit into the whole happy science thing. And, of course, it builds a lot of hype for the unseen within the movie, coolest incarnation of Buddha who lived in the 21st century, naturally. Oh, and we get to spend a bit more time hanging out with Hermes and his deeply religious sea monster buddies in ancient Greece for continuity's sake. Those vignettes can be hilariously blasphemous, but there's not much else to them, and the main plot is paper thin, just the kids trying and failing to time jump home a bunch of times until eventually the boy one finds out the girl one is his great, 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 great granddaughter, so he's not allowed to smash. Really, it's not much to write home about. Luckily, the next one, The Laws of Eternity, which takes a group of college kids on a walking tour through the happy science afterlife by way of Thomas Edison's spirit phone, is more than nutty enough to make up for that. I'm Helen Keller. What? From listening to Edison give a weirdly lengthy TED Talk on the practical utility of spirit world technology for advancing modern human society, to watching a huge angel mech battle an equally massive demonic mammoth commanded by Adolf Hitler and Friedrich Nietzsche's... Hitler Nietzsche's... <laughs> God is dead! God is dead! God is dead! Laws of Eternity is an absolute fever dream of a film you really need to see to believe. Or at least see my extended roast of it, because I made sure to clip all the highlights. Again, the plot's kind of just a framing device and not much to write home about, though the characters are a little more interesting and weird and the dialogue's a lot more entertaining this time around. But it does give me as good an excuse as any to explain to you what happy scientists actually believe about the spirit world. See, according to Okawa, the universe is divided into nine dimensions, with our reality existing in the third. One floor up from that, the fourth dimension looks pretty similar to our own, as it's a transitional space of sorts for the recently deceased to get used to being dead. Once a soul is ready to be judged, it crosses the river Styx to a magic spirit movie theater, in which it is forced to watch a movie of its entire life, complete with every thought it has ever had as color commentary, while its entire family sits behind watching and listening with it, and then it's their job to do the judging. If the soul is deemed to be shitty, it's shuffled off to hell. If not, it gets to see the rest of the spirit world, although it is worth noting that if at any point a soul gets in a bad mood in another part of the spirit world, a portal to hell will open up directly beneath its feet and immediately drag it down to hang with the demons. That's a key part of the cult's mind control, you see. To doubt El Cantare for even a second is to risk eternal damnation. Though, unless you're someone really horrible who gets cast into the lowest circle, like a genocidal dictator or an atheist, your experience of hell will vary depending on your specific sins. For example, violent souls have to live in an apocalyptic wasteland of fire and volcanoes called the Hell of Strife, Individuals who envied those more successful than themselves are forced to work eternal office jobs in the hell of the inescapable pit, and those guilty of the sin of horny get sucked into the hell of the bloody pond, where they're trapped forever in an endless blood orgy. But speaking of pleasant things, let's get back to exploring heaven. 
The fifth dimension, Realm of the Good, is where generally decent and happy folk get to go work in giant vegetable fields and walk around saying thank you to each other all the time forever. But that's just your basic entry-level heaven. The sixth dimension, the Realm of Light, is reserved for those exceptional individuals in fields like art and science to hone their crafts while basking in the inspiring light of the Eternal Buddha. One dimension up from there, we find the Bodhisattva Realm, an exclusive club for those rare souls with the prerequisites to become angels. Billionaire CEOs. In the movie, that's where our hero finds Thomas Edison chilling, along with the founders of Panasonic and Toyota. You never thought angels wore business suits and working clothes, did you? Though Edison is actually just visiting the Bodhisattvas from the eighth dimension, Tathagata Realm an even more exclusive club where roughly 500 people famous enough to get their own chapters in a history book have achieved enlightenment and transcended their physical forms so everyone up there can make infinite clones of themselves and also most of them get blonde hair and blue eyes because happy science is shockingly white supremacisty for an Asian cult. Mr. Edison, you are the god of science the greatest scientist of all humankind. No, that's not true. Above that lies the ninth dimension, the cosmic realm, wherein El Cantare chills with his god homies, such as Zeus, Jesus, and Isaac Newton. But regular souls can't go up there lest they be blinded and or obliterated by the overwhelming godliness of it all, so I guess that's as good a place as any to end the scripture recap and move on to the next movie. Which finally has an actual Honest to El Cantare plot, which El Cantare himself, or at least an alternate universe XB of Okawa, actually gets to play a role in. 2009's The Rebirth of Buddha does not merely adapt the scripture of the revelatory text for which it's named, but rather serves as a loose retelling of the conflicts surrounding happy science at the time of that book's publication. Specifically, their conflicts with other evil cults whose leaders were only pretending to be reincarnations of Buddha and other powerful religious figures, unlike Okawa, who is legit which we get to see through the eyes of Sayako, a plucky young teenage journalist who happens to be able to see ghosts as she investigates that bad cult and gets indoctrinated into the good one by her college-age ex-boyfriend plus her favorite pop idol. The TV said that he was the reincarnation of Buddha. Huh? There's no way that guy can be the Buddha, because I know the real Buddha is... Spoilers, it's Ryuho Okawa. Over the course of the film, the fake reincarnated Buddha, Arai, uses psychic powers to hypnotize people into seeing alien attacks and other apocalyptic scenarios, planning to save them from the danger in order to win their faith. <laughs> But each time Sayako shows up to stop the illusions first, channeling the power of the Okawa XP and ending up as something of a savior figure in her own right. Eventually, the demon in league with Arai, who looks suspiciously like Shoko Asahara, possesses him after getting fed up with his incompetence and kidnaps Sayako, threatening to blow up an entire baseball stadium unless she renounces her faith. Which she doesn't because her faith is, quote, more important than the lives of 50,000 people. Luckily, the Okawa XP shows up to save the day in the nick of time before she can actually put that to the test, but that's a pretty worrying message to put in these movies. Thinking only of one's own happiness is a characteristic of a foolish person. If you think only of your own happiness, it will lead to your spiritual death. Do not use your life only for your own interest. Serrano. It makes sense. But yeah, aside from that kind of worrying call to martyrdom, this whole movie clearly exists pretty much just to throw shade at Om Shinrikyo, and also, more significantly, Soka Gakkai, a much older and more successful Buddhist 
new religion that's been around in Japan since the 1930s, and whose political arm, Komeito, presently holds a frightening amount of power through its coalition with Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party. And that focus on throwing shade makes a lot of sense with the context that Happy Science founded its own political arm, the Happiness Realization Party, in 2008, going on to win exactly zero seats in the 2009 election compared to Komeito's 21. Probably because this incredible movie came out two months too late to expose the demons behind Soka Gakkai before the election, though it could also be because Komeito doesn't openly advertise their connection to an alleged cult. On that note, though, the former leader of the Happiness Realization Party, Jay Iba, left the cult after 35 years of devout service in 2015 to found the Japanese Conservative Union and create the Japanese branch of CPAC. Also, he's a regular at the American one. You can see him here at CPAC 2019, bragging about how much influence he has on Japanese conservatives now in an interview with a different cult's newspaper, which also happens to be a consistent presence at CPAC. Just some food for thought. I don't want to make this video all political, though, so let's move on to the sixth movie, The Mystical Laws, which is about a near-future Nazi Chinese Empire invading Japan, outlawing all religion and use of Japanese, and forcing children to learn about all the war crimes that happy science denies. Fuck. The Japanese once caused great harm and did many bad things, forcing its neighboring countries to suffer immensely. But now, with the help of our great emperor, they are finally starting to become decent citizens. Oh boy. Okawa XB Show Shishimaru actually takes a leading role in this low-rent spy thriller story as a member of the international medical slash religious organization Earth Doctors, which is really a front for the secret society Hermes Wings, an extremely obvious analog for happy science, and the last thing standing between the Chinese and total global domination. They're the last line specifically because Japan is too committed to the self-defense clause of their constitution to even use the self-defense force for self-defense, and the United States' black president slashed their military budget too much. Also, they named that black president Tom Buck to fill their racism quota. In the middle of a search for an ancient artifact that might be the key to stopping the Empire, the old man in charge of Hermes' wings names Sho as his successor, then he's immediately assassinated by invisible Chinese ninjas who were tipped off by a traitor who wanted to be promoted instead. Sho manages to narrowly evade capture thanks to the help of some Buddhist monks from India who tell him that he's secretly the reincarnation of the Buddha. Golly! What a shock! And that it's his destiny to save the world. Which he does, eventually, but not before those dastardly Chinese, led by their Walmart Darth Vader Emperor Tathagata Killer, invade the Japanese mainland and do all that stuff I said earlier. And that's not all. They're also cooking up a secret doomsday weapon behind the scenes that's basically a nuke, only harder. But that project proves to be their undoing when it scares away their benefactor, Leika Chan, who's clearly a stand-in for the new wife that Okawa picked up after his old one left him the year before this came out. But don't you worry about El Cantare losing his way and being attracted to a Chinese girl. They make sure to clarify that she's actually a Scandinavian lady who just dyed her hair black. Or more specifically, she's a Scandinavian-looking alien. Princess Theta of Planet Vega. To me, you look like you're Scandinavian. Here on Earth, that is. Who's been selling alien weapons to the Empire in exchange for them taking her people in as refugees after their planet was destroyed by that very same superweapon. Knowing what it can do, she switches sides and teams up with Sho to infiltrate the superweapon bunker and destroy it. The ultimate destructive weapon. The ultimate destructive weapon. But he ends up being captured and brought before the Emperor for the most symbolically unsubtle public execution ever. And he dies even, though he does soon get better with the power of prayer. 
Bet the real one wishes he could do that. Then, using the power of even more prayer, Sho summons up a super spirit bomb to blast away the Emperor's demon army, plus the Reptalians who just sort of showed up out of nowhere in the last five minutes. And thus, the day is saved. And, more importantly, the movie, and my work for now, is done. Now, there are still three of these left to go, a superhero trilogy that Happy Science claims was penned in part by the ghost of Stan Lee, but that's a topic for another, much longer video, which, again, is coming soon to a mother's basement near you. So make sure you grab some popcorn and stay tuned for that premiere on Friday, March 31st. I'm Jeff Thu, and I, I still haven't figured out what the separate outro for this channel should be, so... Bye!